All right, I think we are ready to start. A very warm welcome to today's uh, digital event hosted by Atlantic Brücke and entitled NATO after Afghanistan. Today, we want to look at the future of NATO after the withdrawal from Afghanistan, um, which we are facing after 20 years. The mission has been NATO's largest and longest endeavor and been a key focus of NATO's overall efforts for two decades. Uh, what does the withdrawal mean for NATO and its future tasks? What impact will the withdrawal have in the region? And what does this mean for geopolitics? What role will the transatlantic alliance play in the future in the Middle East and in the fight against global terror? And what are the expectations for Germany and the US to make the alliance better and more resilient for the future, to name just a few of the questions that we will address uh, in just a minute. I'm delighted that Siemtje Möller, uh, the defense policy spokeswoman uh, of the SPD faction in the German Bundestag, has agreed to chair and moderate today's uh, panel. Um, welcome, Siemtje. It's great to have you. Uh, Siemtje not only is an expert in defense and security policy, but also a member of Atlantic Brücke and a Young Leader alumna. We are honored uh, that Dr. Bruce Jones, the director for the uh, project on international order and strategy at Brookings Institution, has joined us as well. Uh, it's fantastic to have you, Bruce. Uh, great to have you. Thank you uh, for accepting our invitation. And um, also a very warm welcome to Dr. Markus Keim, who is senior policy fellow from the German Institute for International Security Affairs, the Stiftung Wissenschaft and Politik. Uh, who has agreed to also share his insights um, and reflections on what the withdrawal of NATO from Afghanistan means for the alliance. We could not have wished for a more uh, a qualified panel to uh, address these questions and to dare to look at the bigger picture for NATO. Very much looking forward to the discussion. And with that, I would like to hand over to you, Zintje. Before that, just one final housekeeping remark. Uh, please make use of the chat function to ask your questions, uh, participate in the discussion. Um, you may also use the raise hand button and then you have a chance to actually also be invited to the call with video and audio if you prefer that. Then please use the raise hand button or again uh, use the chat function. We will have a look at both. Um, again, with that, hand over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David, for the warm introduction. Good afternoon. My name is Simti Möller. I'm the speaker for defense of the Social Democratic Fraction in the German Bundestag. And I'm very glad to have the possibility to chair um, this afternoon's um, session on NATO and the Afghanistan withdrawal. Um, our guests for this afternoon are first, of, uh, first the guest, so to say, Bruce Jones. He is director and senior and the senior fellow in the project on international order and strategy of the foreign policy program at the Brookings Institutions. He also works with the Center for East Asia Policy Studies, and he's also consulting professor at the Freeman Spogli Institute at Stanford University, and has previously served as the vice president and director for the foreign policy program for the past five years. His research expertise and policy experiences in international security. His current re research focus is on US strategy, international order and great power relations. Apart from his many publications, his most recent book, books on the topics are the Marshall Plan and the shaping of American strategy and still ours to lead America rising powers and the tension between revivalry and restraint. Bruce also has significant experience on multilateral institutions. He was a senior advisor to Kofi Annan on UN reform and ser served as a deputy research director to the UN's high level panel on threats, challenges and change, as well as lead scholar for the international task force on global public goods. So a very, uh, um, a very much expert to the topic and our uh, second panelist is Dr. Markus Keim, Senior Fellow Research Division International Security of the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik based in Berlin. He has worked as an adjunct professor at the Department for Political Science, University of Zurich, and as a guest instructor for the, at the Hertie School of Governance in Berlin. He has been a professor and taught at the Un University of Toronto, the University of Constance as well, as at the University of Jena and has been a fellow at the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies at the Johns Hopkins University in Washington. 
His expertise is the reason he is here today. He has written on German defense and security policy, the transatlantic security relationship, NATO defense and security policy of selected NATO partners, the United Nations and conflict resolution. His current focus lies on the political parameters of multinational military operations. Among many publications, his most recent one is with, the, with his colleagues at the, S, at the Stiftung, a new beginning with, with President Biden, five German and European priorities for the transatlantic agenda. So yet another very much expert to the topic. And the topic is the withdrawal of NATO troops from Afghanistan, which has begun and is currently set to be completed by the 4th of July or the 11th of September. It's not very much sure which date is set, but um, it's. I, I think we can say that it's in between, this is one of them and this is it's very soon. In the wake of the decision, the immediate impact of the withdrawal on the outlook of Afghanistan has received widespread attention, of course, but however, it also marks a milestone for the NATO alliance ending its largest mission after almost 20 years. Therefore, it seems pertinent to consider what the withdrawal means for NATO and the transatlantic, transatlantic alliance as a whole. In Germany, of course, we have a big discussion and debate ongoing on, Bundes on the Bundeswehr um, mission in Afghanistan, but also on the Bundeswehr structure. And we are just in the middle of the debate, uh, even though we are, we are um, also in the middle of the Bundestagswahlkampf of, of 2021. Um, so it is a very, in Germany, we would say it's a Kuddelmuddel. So it's a big, uh, big mess, um, but uh, we are just in the in the center of the discussion. I'm very happy that I have this, these two experts on the panel. So um, we um, we said before, Marcus and Bruce and me, that we will start with the guests. So it's up to Bruce to start with a short input and his perspective on NATO and Afghan and the withdrawal of Afghanistan. Bruce, Bruce, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, very much appreciate that. And I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I had told Peter, I had promised him a year ago that my first trip, once COVID released its, us from its grip, that my first trip would be to Berlin for this session. Uh, the timing hasn't quite worked out yet for that, but I'm nonetheless delighted to be here in person. And I hope what I say won't be so annoying that you then don't invite me to Berlin in person uh, for the next time. Um, to the question. It uh, seems to me that we should start with the point that as NATO exits Afghanistan, it confronts a, an international system and a geopolitical reality which is completely different from when it went in 20 years ago. When NATO went into Afghanistan, it was at the height of American hyperpuissance, as the French uh, called it, of, of unipolarity. Uh, at the height of the dominance of the West in the international system. As it pulls out, we confront a completely changed international picture, uh, much closer to bipolarity or at least asymmetric bipolarity, much more constraints on the West, much more challenge to the West, to the political West in the international system. Uh, that's the reality that NATO has to confront. I think of the future of NATO as involving uh, questions around four regions and four issues. I'll just address each with 30 seconds each, and then we can uh, hear from Marcus, who's more expert on many of these issues than me. I want to start in Europe. Uh, NATO was born as an instrument to protect Europe and the political West from a threat to Moscow. And it seems to me the first and the most important question in front of uh, NATO now is a threat to Europe and the political West from Moscow. It's a very different threat. It's not as severe as the Cold War threat, but it's a real threat. Uh, and it would be uh, the height of irony if in the aftermath of Afghanistan and then taking on new missions, we fail to deal with the, the Russia challenge. Um, and having a, a serious conversation between Germany and the United States uh, and Europe and the United States about how to deal with the Russia challenge strikes me as crucially important. That is wider than NATO. It's an EU question. It's a transatlantic question, but it is also a NATO question. And we can have a proper conversation about Russia now that Trump is not in the White House. So it's uh, important to begin to do that. Second, there's an Asia question, which is really a China question. 
uh, and it's an economic and a technological and a military and an ideological question and a values question. In terms of NATO, the issue is whether NATO has any instrument as an instrument has a role to play in constraining China's ambitions in, in the Indo-Pacific region and et cetera. Uh, it certainly can play a role in the Arctic, I'll come back to that, but it's more of a stretch in the Indo-Pacific where the United States is looking more to the Quad and its Asian partners. But as we see the United Kingdom and as France and others are increasing their naval patrols in the Indo-Pacific and the Western Pacific, et cetera, I think it is worth asking the question, well, where does NATO figure in, in confronting China and dealing with China? China will be the first, second, third, and fourth questions in American foreign policy. So where NATO fits into the China question matters among other things in the transatlantic relationship. There's been an important gap in perceptions about China between Europe and the United States. It seems to me that the, that gap is closing, but it's still there and we have to have a serious conversation uh, about that. There are third continuing issues in the Middle East, um, uh, issues like patrolling the Straits of Hormuz uh, that could be a NATO question. I confess I am not among those who thinks that we should be looking to see uh, more or a wider NATO role in response to uh, civil wars and, and regional insecurity in the Middle East. Um, uh, I always separate the political question of NATO from the operational question of NATO. As, an op as a political mechanism, the response to Afghanistan was extraordinarily important. As an operational mechanism, I think there were a lot of questions in particular because NATO lacks an effective political machinery on the ground and lacks the kind of mechanism of being driven by political strategy and having military tools come in underneath that as well as economic tools, which is what you need when you're managing a civil war. Uh, and I don't think NATO managed that set of issues particularly well. That may be uh, controversial to say, but nonetheless. Uh, and then the fourth region I would pose is the Arctic. Um, we have rapidly moved to a situation where the Arctic is no longer just a question of climate questions and cooperation and commerce and, and energy to one where it is back to being a zone of military deployment and the competition. And it seems to me that it's quite important that NATO play a role there. Again, there are different views on the two sides of the Atlantic about that, and we should be having that discussion in, in real terms. Germany has played a very important leadership role in Arctic science, uh, among other things. There's a lot to build on there, um, but I think there's a NATO component as well. Those four uh, regions, I think there are four issues as well. One is technology. Uh, NATO has emerged as by far and away the most sophisticated shared military instruments on cyber defense. I think it's extremely important to continue to deepen that, to see a NATO role on artificial intelligence, on technological resilience, uh, the technology component, the computational component of military strategy will be extremely important in the coming years. NATO is the best instrument that we have to deal with that and we should strengthen and deepen that. I note that there are, again, quite important differences between Berlin and Washington on Biden's uh, technology strategy. Uh, having a serious discussion on that will matter because this is vital uh, to Biden. Uh, they see this as the absolute core of their strategy. Uh, and so if there's a gap between Berlin and Washington on it, there, there's a potential for a rift there. So I think that's an important one to drill down. On. Second issue is how do we think about structuring collaboration with non-NATO partners? Uh, we did that to a certain extent in Afghanistan with Australia, the Gulf states and et cetera. We're gonna to have to do that now in Asia. Again, really at the core of Biden's strategy is how do you think about uh, better linkages between the Asian alliance structure and the European alliance structure? Obviously Europe has a slightly different vantage point on that, but it will be, I think, critical to address this question of how do we see collaboration with non-NATO partners. We have collaboration with India in the uh, shade operations off the coast of Somalia. Uh, we have Australia, we have New Zealand, but how are we gonna think about that in the, in the Asian context? Third, I'll be very brief on this because Marcus has written extensively about this, but the internal challenge, and what I mean, of course, is Turkey, Turkey, and Turkey. Uh, that is sometimes cast as a values issue, it is that. It's, of course, also about Turkey's relationship with Russia. Uh, we saw Macron being challenging on that the other day. I thought that was a good challenge. We have to confront squarely the question of what happens when a NATO member is behaving in the way that Turkey is behaving. And then closely connected to that uh, is the debate that surrounds this about the balance between Europe and the United States in, in NATO and the whole question of European strategic autonomy versus the balance. I do not think that the question of European strategic autonomy is the right framework to have this discussion. 
I think the right framework to have this discussion is, can we, do we have the arrangements such that NATO could be in a position to mount two strategic operations? One with a heavy American component, but usefully buttressed by European and non-European NATO members. And one with a heavy European component, but usefully reassured uh, and committed by an American uh, component. That is not how we're set up now. It seems to me that it's essential that we think through what it would take to be able to operate in that way. And that's a very different way to think about things than uh, European strategic autonomy, which risks rupturing NATO, uh, which I think is a huge mistake. I wanna end with two quick political points. As we wrap up uh, 20 years of conflict in Afghanistan, we should be clear eyed about the fact that NATO, that Afghan, the Afghan war was a mixed blessing for NATO in political terms, at least in the United States. Uh, at the political level, the fact of European allies rallying to the Article 5 defense uh, was extraordinarily important, but the operational difficulties of NATO took a toll, and as that war became more and more unpopular in the United States, uh, NATO has been more and more associated with American excesses and American overextension in the Middle East, which is not the core purpose of NATO. Uh, beyond a very narrow sliver of transatlanticist elites, there is not a deep understanding in the United States of what NATO is for. And that's a, a ongoing political challenge. Uh, on the other side, I would say, um, there has been an increase in American interest in and support for the EU and an increase in an interest in Berlin's role particularly. That was kind of a bad thing during Trump. Uh, it's gonna be quite a good thing during Biden, but it's a reality. Uh, and the German role in these questions is vital. And therefore I think also the US German dialogue on these questions is vital, which is one of the reasons why I was so happy to try to contribute today. And with that, I will close and, and look forward to Marcus's remarks and then the discussion. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Bruce. I, I wrote down, it's not the core of NATO, but what is the core of NATO? And I'm, I, I, I think that we were, I'm going to discuss this later on. But first of all, we, we, uh, um, we, could, or, or we, we skip to the other end of the Atlantic Bridge over to Marcus to Berlin. The floor is yours. Good afternoon from Berlin. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for the organizers for having me. I would like to make six quick points, three backward looking more or less on the Afghanistan mission of NATO and six forward looking points about the future of NATO. And my first point is stating actually the obvious, um, the transformational effect of ISF or the Resolute Support Mission as it was called after 2014 on NATO has been tremendous uh, and cannot be overstated or overestimated. That applies the purpose of NATO, the outreach of NATO, uh, the posture of NATO, and even the procurement of NATO. Uh, let me start with the first, first point. The purpose of NATO until 20, 2001 has been more or less collective defense and to a certain degree in the 1990s crisis management uh, with the peak of the symbol, symbolized by the Kosovo operation since 1999. However, the, the uh, counterterrorism and stabilization operations have been inserted on the agenda of NATO actually with the Afghanistan operation. So the whole purpose of NATO has changed in military terms and polit political terms as well with uh, ISF and R uh, RSM. Second point, NATO became global. Uh, we, we, tend to follow, we tend to forget this until in Afghanistan operation, NATO was remained more or less to the Euro-Atlantic area, plus the periphery, wherever that ends, uh, plus the neighborhood of the Euro-Atlantic area. But basically, the, the idea of a global NATO, not only in political terms, but in military terms, is closely connected with the Afghanistan operation, for good reasons and for bad reasons as well. And the procurement, even the procurement of NATO, the defense planning process and the procurement processes on the national level, I think all uh, pay tribute to the fact that stabilization operations, counterinsurgency operations have been on the agenda of NATO since 2001 and have not been the sole purpose, uh, 
of the prime purpose, the main purpose of NATO. So our point is, I cannot remember any procurement decision of the last 20 years here applied in Germany for the German armed forces without any reference to the Afghanistan operation. And final, final illustration of the transformational effect, a whole generation of soldiers, of officers has, has been influenced by the, by, the, uh, by the effects of the ISAF operation. Uh, thousands of German soldiers and officers have participated in the operation and uh, they cannot imagine any military career, neither in Germany, nor in the US, nor in NATO, without, uh, without the officer, the soldier, uh, having participated at least once in the ISAF or RSM operation, uh, usually twice or three times. So the transformational effect cannot be overestimated. And I think it will last for a long time. And NATO, as well as NATO member states, armed forces are simply not the same anymore compared to 20 years ago. The second point is a more sober one, or the maybe even a, not, not, not a dark one, but the point to make is here, I think the end of Afghanistan mission marks the end of the era of out of area operations of NATO. Or uh, to be more modest, I think it's very likely that we won't see any more out of area operations of NATO, of the European Union, and maybe not even of the United Nations. I yesterday checked the existing, the actual uh, strategic concept of NATO. And one of the key sentences is, is, is quote, NATO will therefore engage where possible and when necessary to prevent crises, manage crises, stabilize post-conflict situations and support reconstruction, end quote. I have my personal doubts at the new strategic concept, which will be commissioned in a couple of weeks the NATO summit in June will, will have included a very similar uh, sentence. Uh, my take is that the political appetite is uh, to be involved, to get, the, to get the alliance involved in stability operations around the globe is very limited after the Afghanistan operations. And the reason is pretty obvious. NATO was not defeated but the results which have been accomplished in, the, in Afghanistan are very modest. Uh, the sheer numbers of security forces in Afghanistan being trained and equipped by NATO forces are more, more or less sufficient. However, the effect is, effect is, effectiveness and eff efficiency of these armed forces are very modest. Therefore, I think no US president, no German chancellor, no U British prime minister um, is going to kind of come up with the idea that NATO should be involved in any stabilization operation, counter-terrorism organization, counter-insurgency operation of any kind in the foreseeable future. So the big era of out-of-area operations, out-of-area missions, which started in the mid 1990s and which lasts lasted almost 25 years ago, it uh, um, uh, lasted almost 25 years, I think will come to an end. And this closes an era, an era is going to end uh, within NATO. And this is particularly interesting because on the one hand, we might be happy that this, um, let's call it ambivalent experience is going to end. On the one, on the other hand, I think what we currently need, what we currently need, uh, and for good reasons, Western, emphasis, Western governments emphasize this is um, to foster an, an, an effective system of multilateralism. And our purpose uh, of, of the West, of Western nations is to foster multilateralism. And one part of an efficient multilateral system is international peacekeeping uh, and uh, peacemaking. And therefore NATO actually would be needed for these kind of purposes. So it's an amb 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 ambivalent lesson. A third point, we shouldn't forget that it was not only about stability in Afghanistan, what NATO was going to provide or intended to provide, it was liberal transformation. It was a liberal transformational impulse of, of uh, ISAF and RSM. 
which is embodied in all the in all the calls and emphases of for women's rights in Afghanistan, building girls' schools in Afghanistan, providing good governance in Afghanistan, development, and so on and so on and so on. Therefore, it wasn't only about providing stability and security to the country, it was the intention and the ambition was even more. And therefore, my concern is that not only the stability approach or the stability dimension of NATO's approach to Afghanistan has been suffered a blowback, not to mention the word has been defeated, but also or in more in more general terms, the liberal transformational impulse of the 1990s until today has suffered a blowback. Um, and this is particularly interesting uh, for given the change geopolitical environment Bruce mentioned, which can be characterized as a contradiction between the West and authoritarian rulers, and therefore a blowback for Western um, for, for Western transformational ambitions and for Western transformational uh, impulses tells us a lot about the future which, we got, which is going to happen in this distinction between or in this division uh, of the geopolitical environment in the years to come. So it's not only about end of out of area, end of stability, but also the end of stability, uh, exporting stability, prosperity and security by Western countries. Which brings me to my three forward looking points. I think what has been a very interesting experience for NATO was that not only NATO was conducting the mission in Afghanistan, but it was a mission by, uh, as far as I remember, roughly 50 countries with at its peaks, at its peak, 100,000 soldiers. So it was more about um, integrating others into NATO's network. And NATO created, and the Afghanistan operation of NATO has created a huge joint warfare experience, has fostered inter interoperability and transformed Western forces, as I mentioned before. Therefore, I think one of the key challenges for the years to come is how to preserve, not only to appreciate, but how to preserve this experiences of joint warfare, these experiences of interoperability, which has been, which has been gained together in these years in Afghanistan. And therefore, I think we should put, we should put emphasis on this partnership frameworks which have been created by NATO in the last years, and particularly uh, the framework which is called the Partners Around the Globe, in which NATO categorizes a handful of countries as to underline the special status, for example, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, South Korea. And therefore, I think one of the key challenges or maybe tasks is not so much to, re to, to keep NATO um, global in political terms, but even more important, keep NATO in uh, global in military terms, keep NATO interoper interoperable with these countries, which until today participate in certain uh, council meetings in, in in Brussels, and I think we should continue to do this even after the end of the Afghanistan mission, because it was it would be a wasted chance, in my view, simply to tell the Australians, the New Zealanders, the South Koreans, uh, with the with the mission accomplished, that their time is NATO key partners and friends uh, is over. My fifth point is um, more a point of concern. Um, highly likely, given the, 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 the point which I made before, that the pendulum is spanning back away from out of area operations back to collective defense, which has been triggered by the Russian invasion of Sarbas, uh, of the Ukraine in 2014. I think the pendulum since then is swinging back to uh, collective defense. And that has an unintended, unintended effect that NATO likely is likely to be less global in military terms and as well as in political terms. Less global uh, in its outreach and more inward looking, which is an already existing tendency, which can be seen in the United States, as well as in a lot of European countries, not outward looking, not interested in shaping the world, but more inward looking, uh, 
even even uh, isolationist. And this will be supported by the end of the Afghanistan operation as well. However, and I think this is the, the critical point here is the key challenges for maybe not for NATO, but for the Euro-Atlantic countries will come from not from the Euro-Atlantic area, but from the international environment in general, meaning um, so my question would be, can NATO, so, um, uh, uh, how can NATO remain global uh, as much as possible without being a global organization? Because the key lesson of the 2010 strategic concept that the key challenges or even threats for NATO come from outside the of the Euro Atlantic area, I think still holds. And therefore it would be misinterpretation of the international security environment just to withdraw without any um, without any uh, measures to make sure that the the international environment can influence NATO's uh, area. Which brings me to my last point. Given the geopolitical rivalry uh, and given the ge geographic fact that Afghanistan and South Asia is at the doorstep of, of the United States' biggest geopolitical rival in China, I think it, maybe it's time for not a military strategy of NATO for South Asia and Afghanistan, but for a political strategy. And here my argument goes as follows. We have seen a couple of instances over the last couple of years in which the United States world has has withdrawing from some, some regional orders in the international system, in particular in the Middle East. And this withdrawal has been used by others to fill this strategic vacuum, by Russia, by Turkey, by Iran, by Saudi Arabia, but most importantly, by China. Therefore, my question maybe would be, is it a good idea simply to withdraw in military terms from Afghanistan? to let the region alone, or to put it more polemically, to hand it over to the Chinese influence. And I'm not thinking of a military strategy here, but more, maybe it's more about a political strategy for NATO, which can, would be needed for this region of the international system. And that would be one of my, my key expectations for the new strategic concept to define such political approaches to far away, to far away, far away regions in the international system more precisely than it has, done, has been done before. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Marcus. I would like to hand over one question you raised over to Bruce. You asked the question if the complete withdrawal of Afghanistan in the military sense is a good option. I would like Bruce to say uh, or to, to tell us uh, his perspective if it's a good if it's a good option or which option could be better. Bruce, what do you say? Well, I mean, I have to say I would have been among those who argued for keeping some modest presence in Afghanistan, uh, given where we are. That being said, I, I will repeat: I have never been of the view that NATO was an effective instrument in Afghanistan. Uh, it goes to Marcus's last point. It's, it's to me, it's, it's Mar what Marcus said was true 20 years later, we don't have a political strategy uh, for the region. You would think that if we were as the West going to invest 20 years of warfare in a region, we would start with a political strategy. We never did. Uh, and the nature of NATO is such that it leads so heavily with the military instrument, which is the wrong way to approach a question of civil war and internal division and regional insecurity. Uh, it's just a flaw of statecraft. And it seems to me that NATO amplifies that, that weakness rather than corrects for it. Um, so I would have kept uh, some residual presence given where we are, but that does not mean that I think that NATO is the right answer to stabilization in the region as a whole. I wanna address one closely related point. I think Marcus is right that people will conclude that because 
NATO did not succeed in exporting liberalism in a sense to Afghanistan, that we will conclude that we can't do that. Marcus is right that that's the conclusion that will be drawn, but it shouldn't be. There have been 80 civil wars since the end of the Cold War, 80. Uh, NATO dealt with two of them. There are lessons to be drawn from the other 78. And the lessons do not tell us that we cannot succeed in exporting some degree of liberalism. We can't turn Sierra Leone into Switzerland overnight, but we can actually gradually, carefully improve the level of violence, improve governance arrangements, improve economic prospects over time. We have done that reasonably successfully with some failures, with some mistakes, reasonably successfully in about 50 cases around the world. It just wasn't NATO that was doing it. So we have to be very careful not to overlearn the lessons of Afghanistan. Uh, we have to look more widely at the question of stabilization uh, and governance reform, even though, as I said, I don't think that's going to be the core of what we're confronting. The core of what we're confronting is going to be the challenge of China and Russia. But I, I just make that cautionary point. Thanks, Marcus. Does this, uh, um, is this uh, your, um, does this meet your perspective? Or do you see something controversy in it? No, I think I, th I totally agree. My concern is slightly different one. My, my biggest concern is the one which I, which I just mentioned, that we're currently confronted for understandable political reasons with the U.S. administration, which has domestic priorities, which is more or less inward looking to a certain degree, as much as possible, uh, at least. And at the same, to the same degree, we have in Europe, European governments after the COVID crisis or with it together with the COVID crisis, exactly in this context, which are inward looking to the same degree. So what we actually would need is on both sides of the Atlantic, governments which have the political will and the necessary capabilities to, to, to turn outward, to have the, 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 the will to shape the world to influence the world, at least the, the neighborhood, maybe not the world, maybe this is too ambitious, but at least the neighborhood. And this is this is my, my, my biggest concern. For, again, the political reasons are understandable, but we leave a political vacuum behind, which is filled by others. And I think we see it already in Europe, which is not the problem of NATO, from, but from the perspective of the European Union, we confront for the first time with the perspective that the European neighborhood is influenced by others which haven't been there for the last 25 years. That the Russian, uh, sorry, the European neighborhood is influenced again by Russia, by China, by Turkey, by Saudi Arabia, by, the, by Iran and others. And I think this tells us already um, how things might develop. And this is not only a problem of Europe, the European Union, but in military terms, even more importantly for NATO. Um, thanks. When I sat down and was thinking about this, uh, about our upcoming discussion, I was asking myself whether the NATO looks weak after 20 years in Afghanistan without a clear win on its side or not. Because after all, we have to admit that after 20 years, we leave as a whole as NATO as a whole organization Afghanistan without fulfilling our our goals completely. So my question to you is: Do we look weak after twenty years in Afghanistan? Yes or no, or maybe yes and no. And I would I would like to start with Bruce. Yes, Marcus. My typical academic answer would be, I'm not so, I'm not so sure, but maybe, <laughs> maybe weak enough, and this is already, this is already a terrible answer. Weak enough is too weak enough to accomplish what has, has been the goal. And this is uh, not enough for a multilateral uh, military organization of this, of this kind and of this size. Because if you want to add something to your very short answer, then then just jump in. If not, I, I will go on with asking. 
Yeah, just briefly, I would say it goes to my, you know, my recurrent theme about the, the, the mismatch between military and political capability. You know, I, I always thought our goals were, were excessively ambitious. Uh, this was one of the least well-governed countries in the world. We set it out an objective that it should become Switzerland within five years. That was always going to fail. It was, we kept on falling into the same traps over and over again. And what we demonstrated is we have this substantial, even extraordinary military reach, uh, but we do not have effective political strategy for how to project power and how to project liberal values. And our, uh, our adversaries noticed. Thanks, before I come to the question of Robin Fehrenbach who wrote a question in the chat, I would like to um, to, to ask two more questions. How have the events in Afghanistan changed NATO? Does it, does, do they have changed NATO? And what has NATO learned? Or what should NATO have learned? What maybe we didn't learn out of, of, the, out of the Afghanistan engagement? And since we started before with Bruce, I now switch over first to Berlin. I think I made it clear as my first or second point that um, my answer would be yes. And the NATO operation in Afghanistan has totally transformed the alliance. And the whole idea of a, um, of a collective defense organization was put into question um, um, already at the beginning of the 90s or mid 90s with the, with the Balkan Wars then with Kosovo, but finally with Afghanistan, which had nothing to, which had in legal terms to, something to do with collective defense, but not really. Um, and I, I think the, the, if you look at the, the institutional setting of, of NATO, NATO member states, the military integration of NATO doesn't today compared to, let's say 2000, it totally looks different. And I think it, it NATO has become some kind of, uh, sorry, Afghanistan has become some kind of defining, not moment, but defining mission of, um, of for NATO. And for all this reason, I think the, we can't overstate the, the, the transformational effect on NATO, which will, go on, which will last for the, for the next five to 10 years at least. Bruce. What has NATO learned and what did we miss? What should, be, what, uh, should NATO have learned? Yeah, so I thought that um, Marcus's remarks are extremely insightful on that and I will uh, absorb them. Um, uh, I, I keep coming back to the same theme. What we should have learned is that a strategy for managing a crisis, a strategy for responding to a civil war, a strategy for responding to a terrorist organization is political first, military second and we kept on making the mistake over and over and over again of believing that it was security first politics second it has never worked in any context short of a decisive absolute overwhelming victory uh in a civil war context that has never worked uh, you always have to have a political strategy first and underline it with your military and your economic uh, instruments we did not learn that we should have but it's not particularly germane to collective defense. So it, I don't know how much that matters for the future. I don't know. It's germane to stabilization questions. It's not particularly germane to, to uh, collective defense questions. We, before we, we had a conditioned withdrawal from Afghanistan and now it changed to, uh, to a date and the withdrawal will be completed by July 4th or 11th uh, of September. And um, to this, there's a question from Robin Fehrenbach. I probably read it out. Do you think that there is a chance that the peace negotiation talks between the Afghan government and the Taliban at least lead to some degree of stability in the country? We do Bruce, then Marcus. Look again. You know, if you look at the lesson from. Uh, 40 years of civil war management, 80 cases since the end of the Cold War. What you would conclude is that political negotiations can lead to stability if they are backed up by a stabilization force or a peacekeeping force of some type. 
Uh, it doesn't work to have a security strategy without political negotiations, but it also doesn't work to have political negotiations without some security capacity. So I think, unfortunately, the answer is it's very unlikely uh, that we will see stability arising from the talks in the absence of some sort of third party stabilization capacity. I totally agree. I think um, there, is, there is no leverage left of NATO or the West in general or the international community in general. There's no leverage left, neither on the Taliban nor on the Afghan government. Uh, I think that applies to both sides, which can could could buy their cooperation and which could incentivize their cooperation with one another. And therefore, I think we have to prepare for the worst. I'm not so, so sure, and, and sometimes it seems to be some kind of some kind of premature premature to me when I read all the um, articles about we're going to see, we're going to see civil war in six months from now. This is, it seems to be very premature. However, I think it's appropriate to expect that the situation, security situation will deteriorate and the, that even bigger parts of the Afghan population will have to live under Taliban rule uh, than even more than we are already have today. I, I think already, I think 38% of the Afghan population are living in areas which are ruled by the Taliban. Thanks so much. We have a, 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 some, a, someone hand, has a hand risen. It's Wolfgang Richter. And we now give the floor to Wolfgang Richter, please. So um, thank you to the two speakers for very interesting uh, overviews. Um, I was wondering why nobody mentioned um, the mandates given to the different forces on the ground. So you rightly pointed out that we had seen three objectives, uh, counterterrorism first, then a stability mission. From there, one could uh, deduce counterinsurgency. And third, a liberal transformation idea. Uh, when we look at the mandates, we have seen two mandates more or less. Uh, and uh, operations that went in parallel, one on counterterrorism and one on stability. Uh, if we look at the fulfillment of these uh, ambitions, we could say maybe counterterrorism has worked to some extent, maybe even sufficiently. Um, and, and that uh, thing was rooted in uh, self-defense, I would say Article 51 of the uh, Charter of the United Nations. Uh, the stability mandate was given by the UN Security Council, and uh, that is the political framework for, or was a political framework for, for ISAF. The liberal uh, transformation was an add-on, uh, an ambition, I would say, by many countries, including Germany, and it might be, um, it might boil down to a failure, or it would be at least, in my view, probably an illusion on the long run. So, and exactly this last point would lead to the perception of many people that the whole Afghanistan mission was a failure. Uh, and from there, some would even deduce the idea uh, NATO was defeated, but, which I would not share, obviously. So I wonder what, what you can say on these different objectives and mandates. And if you look at mandates, then I would, of course, take issue with the notion of a global NATO. I think there is no global NATO. Of course, there was, um, in military terms, a cooperation with many partners uh, around the globe. Uh, we, we, we showed leadership, military leadership. But as far as a political mandate is concerned, of course, there is no global mandate for NATO, and that would undermine the United Nations. It's just impossible. And I would be interested in your view on, on, on these questions. And if I may, just very shortly, a third one. Um, I wonder uh, uh, to what extent this withdrawal came as a surprise to some countries and was just based on national uh, US decisions. While I would then say um, not too many consultations I could see before, and for Germany, I would uh, I would guess that the Parliament has just um, decided over the next extension by one year of the mandate for uh, our uh, support mission. 
And just weeks afterwards, there was a decision made in Washington to withdraw. So how would you see that? I'm not sure if it was also a question to me as a parliamentarian, but we uh, prolonged the mandate. Um, well, we knew that it that there will be a withdrawal, not to um, not to the July 4th or 11th of September, but there will be an end of the Afghanistan mandate. And um, we knew that we had to prolong the mandate. Um, in the Bundestag because we have to organize the withdrawal of our troops and therefore we need time and we need um, um, a, a le we need a legal basement for for withdrawing and for having military operations on the ground. Therefore we prolonged it but we knew that it would be uh, probably the last time that we are going in a, in, in a prolongment of, uh, of a mandate. That's but just a, that's the a parliamentarian comment. And for the rest, I would uh, hand over to Bruce and Marcus, and uh, we will start with Marcus first, if you wish to comment on what Wolfgang Richter just said. I think that, uh, that applies more to the, the points uh, Bruce made, but I think I totally agree, on, particularly on the mandate. I think so far, or what has been clear, and I think that has been pro properly uh, underlined by Bruce, the the political purpose of the mission has not been clear. And the, the longer NATO was in Afghanistan, the unclearer it has become uh, for understandable political reasons. Again, uh, I think in Germany is in particular case where the civil uh, dimension of the whole operation, the liberal dimension of it has been emphasized to gain for polit for domestic politic reasons and therefore it made it became more and more unclear what as the actual purpose of isaf has been the actual purpose of uh, ISM has been and the actual purpose of operation enduring freedom has been which was at the beginning of the whole afghanistan operation and therefore it has become conflicting patterns of overlapping missions which even to a certain degree contradicted to each other and therefore that explains at least to a certain degree the maybe not failure maybe not the defeat but let's call it again the modest results which were under the ex expectations thanks bruce quick quick answer i wanted to take the second part of the global question um and and i I mean, I'm, I'm, I hope I'm correctly interpreting what Marcus uh, meant, but I'll, I'll offer my own perspective uh, because I don't think Marcus was saying that NATO should be the answer to every crisis uh, around the world. But I will say this, if you've seen from Washington's vantage point, the biggest strategic challenge that we confront is China. The most important alliance we have is NATO. If NATO has no role, in working with the United States in confronting China, then I think we have a very cloudy political future for NATO. Uh, if the most important alliance seen in American terms and in European terms has no role in confronting the most important strategic challenge, then what is its purpose? Now, in my own remarks, I did start with Russia and with Europe, right? Collective defense in Europe, that still matters. But there surely must be a way to have a serious conversation about what role NATO plays vis-a-vis -vis China's uh, increasingly global ambitions. Wolfgang is right though. It does risk challenging the kind of core principles of Article Two of the Charter, the core role of the Council. Uh, but the UN is not gonna be a response to this. And so to ignore the question is also not really an answer. So it's a very thorny topic. Uh, but it does seem to me that the future of NATO must incorporate some degree to which it's uh, uh, engaged in at least some piece of the China challenge. Thanks. And now for a challenge for you, I have two questions and one goes to Bruce and one goes to Marx. Both are written down in the chat. One is, if the European members of NATO basically were drawn into Afghanistan as helping the US, is the outcome of the unsuccessful campaign now lead to a wider gap between the US and Europe? And I propose that this goes to Bruce. And the second question 
as in the Q and A in another chat function from um, an, uh, from someone anonymous. What have the Europeans learned after Trump about the domestic US support for NATO because of unequal burden sharing? It's the 2% uh, debate. And I propose that this goes to Marcus and you have now the challenge to answer in one minute. And then we come to the end of our webinar. So, on the, who's on the that? Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, I think the answer is partially yes. Uh, there is a wider gap between US and Europe, not at the level of the top elites, not at the level of the top sort of managers of NATO, not at the level of the transatlanticists. Uh, but that sort of priesthood, that core of the transatlanticist priesthood is smaller than it used to be. And in wider strategic circles, Afghanistan was not, uh, not super helpful for NATO. Um, uh, my NATO colleagues get upset with me when I say that, but I think it's true. If you look at the reputation of NATO and the wider strategic community in Washington, uh, the political point of Germany, of, of others standing up with the United States under Article 5 was extraordinarily highly appreciated. But the operational reality of NATO was underwhelming, uh, and that did take a toll on, on the reputation of NATO over time. I don't think it's the critical issue. The critical question is whether NATO has a role confronting China. That will be the decisive question in American strategic uh, vision uh, of NATO going forward. I think um, I'm not sure if I understood, if I understood the, the question, question correctly. However, I think there's a clear link between Afghanistan and 2%, which might be a surprise. But the, the rationale behind both questions or both issues is how can we prove from a European perspective, from a German perspective, our appreciation of the US security umbrella for Europe. And what is our contribution to this system of fair burden sharing? And I mean, we have to emphasize or to remind ourselves what led us to Afghanistan. It was the effort of to, to prove our solidarity with the United States after 9-11. And it resonates still today when ministers German ministers emphasize together in together out which resonates exactly or reminds us exactly of this driver and everybody who talks about the two percent goal should keep exactly this is my in this in mind that regardless of the technical details regardless of the question if it's the right measurement that it's perceived in the united states as a sign of as a, as a token of appreciation for the US security guarantees for Europe. Thanks so much also for accepting the change and I'll hand over the, the floor to David. Well, uh, I think we will have a hard time summarizing everything that has been said, but let me say this one thing. I would like to really thank uh, our experts and guests very, very much, uh, in particular, of course, you, Zintje, for steering the discussion. That was fantastic. And thank you to you, uh, uh, Bruce for joining us today and and of course also to you Marcus. Uh, I learned a lot uh, uh, seemed to you said at the very beginning that the situation we are facing in Afghanistan is is a big mess and in fact of course the way in which the withdrawal uh, had been communicated uh, has been heavily criticized um, also that the withdrawal was not tied to conditions and that uh, this has you know weakened also the Afghan government's uh, negotiation position. Um, also that, you know, we, you addressed the fact that a political long-term strategy is, is still missing, but uh, what I found particularly interesting also from your remarks, Marcus, is that you also emphasized the, you know, the learnings and also the positive learnings and the interoperability, the, uh, you know, what we have learned about cooperation and, of course, um, that this really was transformational for NATO itself and the role of NATO in the future as well with regard to uh, China, which uh, you emphasized, uh, Bruce, I think is, uh, you know, are some of the key takeaways. Again, thank you so much uh, for joining us today, also to all our participants. And certainly we look forward to a post-COVID world where we can all uh, convene here at Atlantic Booker in person. And I hope that we will have a chance to repeat this in person with all of you and all our participants. Thank you so much and have a nice day. Goodbye.